Welcome to Carazozo Music. Carazozo Music is a nonprofit organization celebrating its 14th year and it is dependent on grants, foundations, and your generous donations. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we have moved all of our music to a virtual platform for you to enjoy any day and any time from the comfort of your own safe place. Part of the mission of Carazozo Music is to provide school outreach programs, including concerts, workshops, lectures, and demonstrations for the children of New Mexico, many of whom live in impoverished communities and never have the opportunity to experience this type of culture. Performances are funded in part by the New Mexico Humanities Council, New Mexico Arts, National Endowment for the Arts, Western Arts Foundation, Otero County Electric Cooperative Operation Roundup, Tularosa Basin Telephone Company, Zia Gas, and listener donations. Throughout the performance and afterwards, we will answer your questions via our email, carizozomusic at gmail.com. All emails will be answered within 48 hours. Please visit our website to watch and listen to the many great performances we have in our performance library at carizozomusic.org. Remember, donations from you, the viewer, are important to the success of this organization. Thank you. Hi, everyone out at Carrizozo Music School. My name is Steve Swinburne. I'm so happy to be with you now. Um, welcome to my office, which is full of books, as you can see, and musical instruments. Here's my, my instrument called the ukulele. I've got a couple of drums over here. Chico African drum. Love that thing. Um, I'm so happy to be with you today to talk about books and where you get ideas for books and how you begin to take that idea and research it and move it along into um, a first draft. Um, so this is exciting. I plan to uh, do some singing. Uh, you're going to see some videos and you'll see some um, slides and of my books and so forth. And um, let's get started. Um, I haven't always been an author. As you can see behind me, I love reading, but um, I never, when I was a kid, I didn't like to read that much, but it came along uh, as my nan, my grandmother, uh, I was watching her reading and I love the way she always loved books and loved reading. I said, something must be there. So I really got into reading uh, later on, a little bit later on, but um, for jobs, I've had many, many jobs. My first job, I think I was a newspaper delivery kid. And uh, then I got a job as a dishwasher. I got a job as a busboy, a waiter, a truck driver. I was a pizza pie guy for a while. I put up, I painted houses. I put up swimming pools. Uh, one summer I was in a rock band. Yeah, played the drums. And um, then I got a job as a naturalist, a National Park Service Ranger. And finally, all those jobs came together as a writer, as an author. And I love this job. And I, and I think back on all those jobs and I think about all the different shoes that I used to wear because you wear a different shoe if you're a construction worker rather than a ballerina. So I started thinking about all the jobs I had and all the shoes I had that related to different jobs. And I said, I wonder if there's a, I wonder if there's a, uh, a book there. I wonder if there is a, um, a song there. So I wrote this song to kick off our, our program today called Whose Shoes Will You Wear? And it's actually based on this book called Who Shoes? A Shoe for Every Job. I usually do the song with my wife as backup. So if I can do it solo today. As you guys know, being musical folks, always make sure your instrument is in tune. I wake up in the morning. I wake up in the morning, got some place to go. I'm looking for my shoes. I really want to know whose shoes will you wear? Will you wear? Will you wear? Whose shoes will you wear? Will you wear? Will you wear? Whose shoes will you wear when you do the work that you do? Could it be a teacher? 
future standing all the day could it be a farmer piling up the hay what about a rock star rocking out the beat what about a shortstop twirling on his feet whose shoes will you wear will you wear will you wear whose shoes will you wear will you wear will you wear whose shoes will you wear when you do the work that you do Maybe you're a singer, dancer, lawyer, captain, chef Maybe you're a writer, soldier, doctor, dentist, nurse Maybe you're a banker, bowler, baker, billionaire Maybe you're a pilot flying people in the air Maybe you drive NASCAR, zipping in cast cars Maybe you're an astronomer, counting all the stars Whose shoes will you wear, will you wear, will you wear where will you wear, will you wear, whose shoes will you wear, when you do the work that you do, one more time, whose shoes will you wear, will you wear, will you wear, whose shoes will you wear, will you wear, will you wear, whose shoes will you wear, when you do the work that you Whose shoes will you wear? One of my favorite musicians are these guys, the Beatles. I thought I'd wear my Beatle t-shirt today because when I think about music, think about words, think about poetry, these guys were fantastic. Um, so I showed you one of my books, Whose Shoes. That is a nonfiction photo book, but I've written so many books and so many of my books are about one of my favorite things in my life, which is nature. Um, I've written a book called Once a Wolf, How the Wolves Came Back to Yellowstone. We talk a little bit about uh, sea turtles today. I love sea turtles. I've written three sea turtles books. Here's Turtle Tide, my first sea turtle book about a mama sea turtle coming up to lay her eggs on the beach. This is about a sea turtle scientist who is trying to save sea turtles. There she is. And my most recent book, my most recent sea turtle book is called Run, Sea Turtle Run, A Hatchling's Journey, about the, the leatherback sea turtles dashing down to the ocean and um, safe in the storm, how animals protect their babies in a storm. And one of my favorites, I love the illustrations in this book, is Safe, Warm, and Snug, all about how animals protect their babies and comfort them. Illustrations by Jose Arruego and Ariane Dewey. I'm the author of this book. I wrote the words, the illustrator, the person who makes the beautiful artwork is called the illustrator, the artist. Some books, as you can see, have photographs. Illustration, photographs. They're both fun to do. And right now I'm working on a book all about monarch butterflies and I'm taking the photographs for that book. Let's dive into my program. Um, this is a program called From Blank Page to Book, how we go from a, a, just a bare, and I know you faced it too, you've got, a, you've got a sheet of paper or a blank computer screen, where do you get an idea, how do you take that idea and create a story, so hopefully this program um, will uh, give you some ideas, give you some inspiration, I'm going to share my screen with you right now, here we go, okay. Let's get this started right there. Hello, Carrizozo music students. And I love this, this phrase up, up at the top. If we all do, as a matter of fact, let me see if I can minimize myself. There we go. And can I bring that down? Oh, I can't. Okay, we gotta go back. If we all do one random act of kindness a day, we might just set the world in the right direction. Isn't that wonderful? Do something nice for folks. Um, imagine your story. That's what we're talking about today. So here's a map of the United States. And uh, I live in the northeast part of the United States in a place called South Londonderry, Vermont. And you guys are way over in Carrizozo, New Mexico. I have been to New Mexico many years ago, and I'd love to visit again sometime. Uh, <laughs> my first car. 
I was born in London, England. Uh, maybe some of you were born in a different country. I came to America when I was eight years old, but that was my first car. I remember driving around London. Here is my family when I was growing up as a kid. And I say their story of Nan or my story of, of my grandmother. My Nan, as I mentioned before, loved to read. And I would watch her go to the library, big, get a big pile of books and she'd come back and read them. And on, she'd get this pile of books on Saturday by Monday, they would be gone. I said, something must be um, involved with reading. And she used to read to me. And I want you guys to think about the very first time books came into your life. Did your mom read them, your dad, your grandparents? Think about that. Welcome to Vermont. Guys, I bet we have a very different habitat or an environment in Vermont than you do in New Mexico. Perhaps you're very dry. I'm not sure what part of New Mexico you're in, but as you can see, we're in, right now in Vermont, we're just entering autumn, the fall, where our sugar maple trees are turning magnificent colors. And I tell people, if you come to Vermont, it's always a great time to come late September, early October, when all our fall foliage is turning. Aha, here's my family, um, go, starting with uh, my wife on the left, my left, I'm not sure if you'd be your right, that's my wife, Heather, that's me, uh, there's my daughter, Devin, next to Devin, between Devin and myself would be my son-in-law, Willie, that's my first grandchild, Essie, and my daughter, Haley, and we've, ju we've just added a new member to our family, that's uh, Essie, and Cuddling is little Gus. Gus was born in June and he's what, two, three, four months, maybe three and a half, four months. So that's the family. Books are magic. I want everybody to say books are magic. I think I heard you. I think I heard you all the way from, he uh, from here in Vermont. Yes, they are. They, mag they can take you so many different places. Always remember books are magic. Okay, let's introduce you a couple of other members of the family. Uh, this is Scout. This is Jem. These are our two doggers, doggies. They're sisters, and they're, that's us walking on a very cold day in Vermont. Here's the house. It's an 1860 farmhouse picture in the summer, and here's the winter. That's what we're about to enter as we uh, get closer to the winter. And guys, we live on a river, and um, I want to share with you how cool it is to live on a river. We, it, we call it the West River. It's a short river, about 56 miles, starts in the mountains and uh, empties into a much bigger river. But being so close to this river, it's kind of like I get a chance to see it all through the seasons. And I want to share with you the way this river kind of changes. Habitats change. It's a beautiful habitat. So we're going to start out in the summer. And if you're quiet, and hopefully this will come through, you can hear the the different sounds that the river makes throughout the year. This is July and listen to this quiet, sleepy little river. It, you can walk across this river. Uh, there's fish there, there's frogs, there's, there's butterflies, there's um, all sorts of animals that live in and around the river. Birds are singing. You could float down that river. Not very deep. Some places it's maybe two feet deep. But it runs all year long. So that's July. That's the summer. Now we get closer to the fall and the leaves are starting to fall into the, into the river. Still moving. You can see that it's the, the river height has dropped. Those rocks are showing. And now we move into the winter. Oh, I've seen moose in the river. I've seen deer cross that river. You have to think about why water is such an important thing in the habitat. Can you guys think about that? Why would water be an important thing in, a, in, a, in an animal's habitat? Well, if a deer or a moose or a bear or a, a, a possum or a porcupine or a raccoon is up in the woods and they're really thirsty, where are they going to go for the, to, the, to get a drink? They're going to go down to the river. So it provides so much nourishment and food for animals. Now, we've gone through summer fall, winter. Now, watch what happens as things warm up and we enter spring, March, April. Look what happens to all that snow and the spring rains and, and enters the river. And this is what the river will look like now. You would not want to get into that river now. That's a great thing for it. I think it's right now. I don't think you can battle that, that flooding river very hard. that 
that's that summer sleepy stream. So rivers change. As a matter of fact, I've just written a book called The River Is, and I'm using different words to describe how a river could be. A river could be a supermarket, a river could be a school, a river could be a home. Uh, and I'm using these as metaphors when one thing uh, looks like or think seems to be another thing. Let's talk about where we get story ideas. I'm, I bet you think could think of a lot of different places where you can get ideas for stories. I wanna share with you where I got a story idea a few years ago. I went to visit my in-laws down in Brooklyn and one day, one Sunday, went out to get coffee and uh, the newspaper. When I got the coffee and the bagels, I'm bringing back the coffee and the bagels, and I'm passing the car wash. I'm looking at this car wash, and I said, I bet there could be a truck wash. I wonder if there's a place that washes trucks. Places that wash the car, there must be a place to wash the trucks. So I went home, and I started a book called The Big Truck Superwash. I'll read you a little of it here. Right now, this book is being illustrated. Hopefully, it should be out in a year or so. Wham, clatter, clang, bang, boom, pop. Trucks plow and play until it's time to stop. And now, guys, is this rhyming poetry? Think about this. When work is done across the town, hardworking trucks need to wind down. Before you stop, tuck your boom in tight, drop your blade plunk, and say good night. Let's wash away your dirt and muck. Everyone loves a clean, cool truck. At the Big Truck Superwash, cleaning is our game. Dirty buckets, blades, and booms, we're sure glad you came. But guys, think about how I got that idea. I was watching a car wash, and I came up with an idea. So allow your mind to be open to other interesting new, <coughs> excuse me, fresh ideas. One day, a couple of summers ago, I'm driving down the road in my truck and I see this thing in the middle of the road. You can see the yellow line there. <clears throat> and I said, what is that? So I pulled my truck off the side of the road. I hopped out. I made sure no traffic was coming. I walked up to this turtle, a beautiful wood turtle. I said, buddy, what are you doing in the road? He said, Mr. Steve, can you help me? I said, no problem. So I picked him up and I moved him way off the road and he started wandering off on into the grass, into the woods. So I saved that turtle and I started thinking, hmm, saving animals in the road. Here's another little critter that I moved off the road, <coughs> spotted salamander. One spring evening, I found a spotted salamander. I found a little peeping frog, spring peeper. So I said, maybe there's a book there. Maybe there's a book there about saving animals in the road. Now, I have a friend named Jerry Pallotta. Maybe you know this guy. He's a really um, wonderful author who writes these books, Who Would Win? And he said to me one day, Steve, what are you doing this weekend? Do you want to come to Boston, where I live, and we can go lobstering? I said, Jerry, I'd love to, but I don't know how to lobster. He said, don't worry, I'll show you. So we drove out there and we spent the weekend with Jerry. And here is a lobster. It's a female lobster covered with eggs. Check this out. Here we are at Peggy Beach, Massachusetts. And this is a female lobster. You can see all the eggs. And uh, we have to throw her back. She's a beautiful lobster right here in Massachusetts. So I want you to think about those three story ideas, a story about uh, a, a truck wash. Um, a story about saving animals in the road, a story about going lobstering with a friend. So you see how life experiences can lead you to think about a book idea. So explore the world and see if you can't come up with some very interesting, cool ideas. And again, you don't have to go very far to find things to study. Sometimes stories are close at hand. This Two summers ago, I built a monarch way station. Basically what that means is that I put in a whole bunch of flowers that monarch butterflies would love to eat and to raise their young. So I spent a lot of time this summer, last summer, looking at monarch butterflies. They live on the milkweed plant. And one day I found eggs. I said, I'm gonna follow this little egg all the way through till it becomes a butterfly. So I took pictures. They stay in the egg form for three days, then they hatch. Look at that tiny little caterpillar or larva 
it might be called. And you know when they're about to hatch because the little top of the egg turns black. That's the head of the caterpillar. They come out. And one time I got a chance to photograph a tiny monarch butterfly caterpillar eating its eggshell. And you might say, well, wow, why is it doing that? Because it's full of protein and nutrients and it's the first thing it eats. And then it turns its attention to the milkweed leaf and it eats and eats and eats and eats and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's gonna stay get in the caterpillar form for about two weeks. Notice it also poops, that's what happens. And then at some point it will has said, I have had enough to eat. It hangs under a milkweed leaf or some place that's quiet where it can rest in a J formation. It doesn't hang straight. See how that's hanging in a J they call it? That will eventually turn into the chrysalis. And as you guys know, right? Um, monarch uh, or caterpillars or monarch butterflies have four different life uh, uh, stages. One, the egg, two, the caterpillar, three, the chrysalis, and four, the adult. So we've now arrived at the chrysalis. There it is turning. And it will stay in this form, the chrysalis or pupa, you sometimes hear it's called, for about two weeks. <clears throat> and as you can see, it first starts out as green. Then it gets very dark and you can see the wings of the butterfly. And I was fortunate enough to photograph a monarch butterfly coming out of its chrysalis. Check this out, guys. Here it comes. I don't think that butterfly could fly. Its wings are all droopy. There's its tongue. Okay, right there's the tongue. It's going to turn around and those wings have to be pumped up full of fluid and get nice and solid. And that will take about an hour, maybe two hours. And look at that little butterfly. And after a while, that little butterfly looked really good. So it flew off into the air, but the strangest thing happened. I've never seen this before. That butterfly landed back on my finger and started licking my finger. I couldn't believe it. Every time I threw this little butterfly in the air, it landed back on my finger and started licking my finger. It, threw, it landed on my head. And finally I released it way back up in the sky and it flew away. And I said, I love you butterfly. And it said to me, I love you too, Steve. And guess what? I called a friend of mine who knew about butterflies and said, why would this butterfly land on my head? Um, and they said, did you put anything on your skin that morning, on your hands, on your face? I said, well, my hands were kind of dry. So I got some coconut oil and I smeared it on. Don't you love that word, smear? I smeared it on my hands and then I, may, I must have put some on my face too. And, and, the, and my friend who knows about insects said, yes, that Butterfly is looking for nutrients and maybe it found some nutrients and minerals in that coconut oil. Isn't that interesting? Now we know that all the monarch butterflies on the east coast of America and on the west coast are flying south. As you can see, they're all flying to this wonderful place in Mexico where they will overwinter. For years, no one knew where they were headed. Millions of monarch butterflies, each weighing less than a penny, winging their way from state to state. But with the help of a little applied science and thousands of citizen scientists, an amazing discovery was made. Experience the flight of the Butterfly's omni-theater film and Butterfly House. See the film, feel the flutter. Isn't that wonderful how all those butterflies head south? Um, and I'd love to know if you guys ever see monarch butterflies where you live. You know that every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. In my book, Turtle Tide, the mother comes up to lay her eggs. It's a loggerhead sea turtle and her e eggs drop ones, twos, threes, wet and glistening in the light of a rising moon. She covered those eggs. She headed back to the ocean. The turtle dove into the face of the moon, a giant yellow moon sleeping on the sea. She didn't look back. She swam on and on. Uh-oh, raccoons found her eggs and what had been 100 was now 64. 65 days later, the baby turtle somehow knew it was time. We've reached the middle of the book. I love this illustration. It shows what is happening underneath the sand as the turtles break out of the eggs. They break out as a team and they actually rise up like a very slow elevator to the top of the sand. They work together as a team. And when they reach the top, 
There's only one place they need to go, that's to the ocean, but it's a very dangerous place for small, soft turtles. Lots of animals might be waiting for them. Ghost crabs with oversized pincers seize those hatchlings that came close, and what had been 100 was now 22. Quick, get down to the ocean. Uh-oh, a sand shark cruised the shallow water and ripped through the band of little turtles, and what had been 100 was now only two. And finally, we end up on the last page. We read the end of the book. The sky turned red and gold. The sun rose over the edge of the earth and what had been 100 was now one, following the ancient path to home. And this is actually based on science that uh, most scientists say out of 1,000 hatchlings, only one will survive to adulthood. Sad, but true. Now, I think when you write a book like this, you've got to do a few things. Essentially, you got to do three things. Go out and research the animal. There I am in Africa learning about a rhino. Come back, take lots of notes, do lots and lots of reading and get really smart, build up that knowledge, become like a sponge of, of information and finally sit down and write a first draft. It's not always easy writing a draft, but you got to get it down. You can always fix it up. Don't worry about it. Get those initial words down and then you can edit it. And it's really important to edit. I think most of the best writing comes out in the second, third or fourth draft. One thing you should know when you go to rewrite of two of your best writing tools are strong verbs and cool details. You guys know what a verb is. A verb is an action word like jumping or swinging or swimming and cool details are this really cool nitty gritty things that you see and feel in life, sound, smell, that good stuff. You know what? Don't be afraid to make mistakes. Don't be scared. Every day I fail at writing, I make mistakes, but that's okay. We want you to make mistakes. We want you to mess up because you know what? Then you're only going to get better. I love the research process, as I said before. I love going out there and learning about animals. The best nonfiction writing begins with a writer's passionate curiosity about a subject, Say, says my friend Ralph Fletcher. And that's true. You guys know that I love animals. So I love researching black bears. And one time I went into a cave with some scientists and I pulled out two baby bear cubs. That was a wonderful experience. And that's where you really can put that experience into a book. Um, studying wolves in Yellowstone National Park. How about manatees in Florida? And sloths in Costa Rica, safe, warm, and snug. Safe in a storm. Oh, I love the ocean. And I know that you probably don't have ocean near you, but uh, many years ago, we went to the main coast and I studied tide pools. These little pools, these temporary pools that, that of, of seawater that come up near the ocean. And I decided to write a book about those tide pools. I oh, even... tide pool soup is really good. It makes a delicious snack, but be careful when you take a bite, the soup might bite your back. Crabs pinch and urchins poke. Soup that bites is no joke. I live in this room close to the sea where the view is great and the food is free. Some of the tenants come and go. Some I eat if they're too slow. One end of me is firmly locked. The other end gently rocks. I live in this room close to the sea. Oh, what a life for an anemone. Isn't it fun to have fun with poetry? How about this one? Lying on my back in this small teepee, waiting for the tide, waiting for the sea to do the fail to feed, the fail to feed. Waves come tumbling, I'm in the mood to open my top and snack some food and do the fail to feed, the fail to feed. You want no crab, you want no prawn, all I want to eat is fresh plankton and do the fail to feed, the fail to feed. Now I got the rhythm, dancing in the brine, life as a barnacle is so sublime. I love the fail to feed, the fail to feed, the fail to feed. The well, as you can see, you can have a lot of fun. Uh, playing with poetry and words. And I really love that book, Ocean Soup. Here's a book I mentioned before, Sea Turtle Scientist. Uh, this is the most endangered 
sea turtle on the planet. It's called the leatherback sea turtle. And um, I left snowy Vermont to go do my research in the Caribbean islands um, where I met this wonderful scientist named Dr. Kimberly Stewart. And Kimberly moved there um, to study sea turtles, but she grew up in a place called Georgia and she loved animals, her parents and grandparents um, raised her on a farm. So she loved cats and dogs. And she thought one day I would love to be a scientist. And when she once got an opportunity to hold a little sea turtle, it changed her life. So she moved to the island and she dedicates her life to saving these sea turtles. First of all, she's got to learn so much about them. And it's a creature that we know very little about because it lives in the ocean. And, and the only time we can really study it is when it comes up on, on the land as the females do to lay their eggs. Beautiful creature, dives super deep in the water. What do you think a creature that that size would like to eat? Well, you are right, jellyfish. Here's the problem with jellyfish. How do you get that slimy thing down your throat where they have a special adaptation cool word in their mouth. Check out the open mouth. Look at that. All those spines pull in, make sure that the sea turtle, that the, sorry, the jellyfish goes all the way down. Pretty cool mouth, huh? And there it is, the mama sea leatherback coming up to lay her eggs, about 100, 120 eggs. Here we are in the middle of the night, watching and counting the eggs using red filters on our cameras so we don't hurt her eyes with white light. And here she is covering up her eggs. She spent about an hour trying to camouflage and smile over her nest. She does not want any predators there. That's what she can do. She's an enormous creature and there she is heading back to the ocean. And she'll probably come back three, four, five times a summer to lay eggs. Sometimes she, she's, she's a new mom and she doesn't realize she's got to go way back, back up the beach. And here we found uh, a nest that had been washed out by the high tide waves. One time we were watching a mama sea turtle lay her eggs and we thought she's nesting way too close to the ocean. So after she finished nesting and covered up and went back to the ocean. We ran over before the, the tides could come in and we picked up, dug up all her eggs and put them in a sack and we moved them further up the beach to a safer location. So it felt really good to help out those sea turtles in that way. Here's, the, here's what we're talking about guys, here's the egg. That is a leathery sea turtle egg and it may be hard to get out of that egg as a little hatchling, but I have a special thing on my beak called a nose pick. Look at that little thing. That is my little, that little nose point that is gonna help me get out of my egg. It's, it's gonna scratch it and look at that. Isn't that great? Here will they come. Watch this. They all come out together as a team. There they go. Those are those little leatherback hatchlings coming out. And you know, they don't need GPS. They don't need maps. They know where they're going. They're heading right to the ocean. Finally, look at the little tracks it makes into the ocean and they know how to swim. They know where they're going and off they go. They are gonna go from a tiny little hatchling to a giant magnificent adult. This is sometimes a problem. What is that? Uh, that bag can, um, can end up in the ocean and then a sea turtle, as you know, eats jellyfish. And that bag, when it fills up, could look a lot like jellyfish. So guys, if we want to do one thing to save dolphin and sharks and birds and sea turtles, let's keep those plastic bags out of the ocean. What a great thing to do. Carry a recycled bag to the grocery store. See, they don't see the difference between a plastic bag and a jellyfish, but you do. So let's help them out. There's a beautiful sea turtle beach in the Caribbean Islands. Perfect for sea turtles. Now, I was so excited about sea turtles. Of course, you know that I have to write a song. And here's a song about sea turtles and eggs. And it's called One in a Thousand. 
sing along. One in a thousand and I'm on my way. Oh yeah. One in a thousand and I'm leaving today. Give me a chance, I've got to reach the sea. Give me a chance, it's a leather back I want to be. One in a thousand. I'm one in a thousand. I'm one in a thousand. That's me. One in a thousand and I'm homeward bound. I'm one in a thousand. I swam the world round and round. To leave the ocean and to crawl on the land. A set of tracks, plenty of veins in the sand. I'm one in a thousand. I'm one in a thousand. I'm one in a thousand. That's me. Give me a chance, I've got to reach the sea. Give me a chance, it's a leather back I want to be. I'm one in a thousand. I'm one in a thousand. I'm one in a thousand, that's me. Nice singing. I think I heard you all the way here from Vermont. Uh, on my trip to the Caribbean, uh, again, you take notes, um, you keep a journal. I try to keep a journal for every book that I make, and I keep a journal in my own life. I think it's such a great thing to do to get your write, writing juices going. Keep a journal, a diary, a writer's notebook. Make it yours. Make it fun. You can put stuff in it. It's a great way to really uh, fall in love with words. Let me finish off with a story that I did with uh, this wonderful uh, alligator expert named Dr. Louis Gillet. He's a wonderful scientist on reptiles, but he's also a wonderful photographer. And he and I decided to do a book together called Alligators Make the Best Moms. I wrote the words and Lewis did the photographs. And it's in the voice of the mother alligator. They are super protective moms. They will lay their eggs in a big pile of hay and straw and lots of animals might want to come and eat those eggs or those hatchlings. Of course, as you know, the alligator is a carnivore. Um, lunch was good, but I have to get back to my nest. I stand guard. What do I hear? Chirp, chirp. My baby alligators cry. They are ready to hatch. Now, the mama helps them by pulling apart the nest. Now, listen to this. They make a little funny noise called erp. Erp, that's the signal that the mom hears and says, yep, it's time for them to come out. They took an egg in the laboratory and hopefully you can hear this. That's a little alligator hatchling about to pop out. <clears throat> come on, you can do it. Get out of that egg. There it comes. Now, I want you to notice something about this little hatchling. Look at all those stripes on that body. Do you think they might be important? Well, when that alligator hatchling goes out to the, 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 the swamp or the pond, you know it. They disappear. And there's a whole bunch of little hatchlings there with the mama. So this is a great way to stay camouflaged. And I wrote a poem. Don't get too close to a crocodile or you will see a crock a smile. You don't want to see a crock a smile. That's way too close. Do you guys know the difference between a crocodile and an alligator? Well, look at the top. What do you think that is? Take a guess and look at the one on the bottom. Well, the top one is the gator. You is, and, and you can see, well, you is the snout. You can see that snout is uh, in a U shape. That's a gator. The V snout for a croc 
and that's a crocodile down there. And look at this teeth. With the gator at the top, the teeth just come down. Uh, that's all you see. But with the, with the crocodile below, the crocodile, you can see the teeth coming down, but also going up. So there's a couple of different ways to check out um, alligators versus crocodiles. Let me finish off with one of my last trips to, uh, that I made uh, to Kenya, to Africa. We went, uh, went there to visit some kids in school. And while there, I decided to write a book about giraffes, all about giraffe, all about math. So the book is called Giraffe Math, which should be out in about a year. I love the way they walk. Check out this, the tallest creature on the planet, 19, 20 feet tall. They have these horns, which are called ossicones on the top of their head. Isn't that magnificent animal? And one time I went to a place where you could take a biscuit in your mouth, in your lips, and the, and the, croc, uh, the crocodile, um, the giraffe, that's what it's called, comes over and slurps it right out of your lips. And then someone told me, you know what they do with their tongue, the longest tongue of any animal? They might clean their nose. Gee, great, thanks. Okay, guys, five reasons to love nonfiction books. Say it with me. One, you learn cool stuff. Two, you can share what you learned with friends. Three, you may discover your passion. Four, your brain grows. Five, you become happy. Great reasons to love nonfiction. You guys know that good readers become good writers. You can read on a rock. You can read in a pile of leaves. You can read up a tree. You can even read in a bathtub. Just make sure, of course, that the water's not running. So read a book today. It's going to be great. My latest book, Run, Seedle, Turtle, Run, A Hatchling's Journey. Here we go, guys. Awesome. <laughs> that was awesome. Okay, let's see if I can stop this sharing. Uh, where'd it go? Aha, let's move this out of the way. And here we are, we're back. Guys, thank you so much. I hope you were inspired. I hope that you got some good information. And um, I love being with you. And I'd love to hear any comments or questions that you might have about my program or any particular books that I've talked about. And um, keep on keeping on, keep reading, keep writing, get a journal going. And um, I wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Steve Swinburne, signing off.